In this video, we're going to discuss our second comparison test called the limit comparison test. So just recall that what we're trying to do is just simply determine if a series is convergent or divergent, because we're not going to be able to calculate the sum when a series is convergent, but we don't need to know that. In a previous video, we talked about the comparison test or direct comparison test. Now we're going to use something called the limit comparison test. So let's look at the series, which is very similar to an example we did before. In our previous video, we had 2 to the power of n plus 1 in the denominator. Now we have 2 to the power of n minus 1. Now, we wouldn't expect the plus 1 or the minus 1 really to have that big of an impact on the convergence or divergence of the series. So we would expect that this uh, series would be convergent. But we've got a problem with using the comparison test. 2 to the power of n minus 1 will be less than 2 to the power of n. And so then I'd have 2, the reciprocal, 1 over 2 to the power of n minus 1 would be greater than my convergent series, or greater than the terms of the convergent series. So I can't use the comparison test, at least not with the uh, con ge convergent geometric series I did in the previous example. The inequality simply goes the wrong way. I am bigger than a convergent series, and so I can't make any conclusion using the comparison test. But it's so tempting because I know that look, when n is large, there's really no uh, significant difference between 2 to the power of n minus 1 and 2 to the power of n. In practice, n goes to infinity. The limit of the ratio of those terms turns out to be 1. So it seems like there should be a way to use this 1 over 2 to the power of n to determine or demonstrate the convergence of this series. Well, that's where the limit comparison test will come in. You know, suppose I just have two general series with positive terms. Again, these comparison tests only work with series that have all positive terms. And let's assume that the uh, series with the BN terms is convergent. And we have something similar to what we had in our first example that the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of a over n, a sub n divided by b sub n, is some constant c where c is a positive number. It's, it doesn't equal zero. Well, what does that mean? Well, for that limit to exist, that means that uh, I can find a positive integer, capital N, uh, capital M, uh, such that whenever lowercase n is bigger than or equal to uppercase m, the difference between the terms in my sequence, now this is a sequence that I'm looking at, I'm looking at only the individual terms from the series as a sequence, and their limit value, well that can be made as close as I want, and I want it to be as close as one half of C, whatever C is. I want the terms to be within one half of C uh, from the final limit value. Well, that absolute value inequality, I could also write as a three-part inequality. That means a sub n over b sub n minus c has to be greater than negative one half c and less than one half c. So for now, I'm going to focus on the less than part. I'm going to go ahead and add c to both sides, and that will tell me that a n over b n 
must be less than three halves C. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Let's do some algebra. The terms that I'm trying to show as being convergent, A sub N, is the same as this ratio, A sub N over B sub N, times B sub N. And what do I know about the ratio? I just said the ratio is smaller than 3 halves C. So this says that A sub N must be smaller than 3 halves times a constant times B sub N. So since the series with the B sub N terms is convergent, if I multiply each term by a finite constant, then it's also going to be convergent. And then whether I start at 1 or I start at capital M, I'm still going to have convergence. So by the comparison test, now I can use the comparison test because A sub N in general may not be larger than B sub N, but A, I mean smaller than B sub N. But now if I take B sub N and multiply it by this constant, I'm guaranteed that at least in the tail of the series, the A sub N terms are smaller than 3 halves times C times B sub N. So I can say that the tail of the A sub N series must also be convergent by the comparison test. And well, if the tail is convergent, then the rest of it is going to be convergent because I only have a finite number of terms, so I can take their partial sum, add it to that convergence tail, and that means the whole series will be convergent as well. All right, well, what if I have the case where uh, B sub N is divergent? What does that tell me about my A sub N? Well, as long as I have this property where I have positive terms, the limit of the ratio of the terms is a constant which itself is positive, then I can use the same logic, get the same inequality. But now my focus is going to shift to the less than part here, or if you want to consider the ratio, what what is a sub n over b sub n greater than? So I'm going to focus on this part of the inequality because that would tell me after adding c to each side that a sub n over b sub n, that ratio, is going to be greater than half of c. Remember b sub n, the series with b sub n is divergent. And now I'm going to be able to state, make a statement about uh, a sub n being larger than a constant times the terms of a divergent series. And so since we have uh, the series with the b sub n being divergent, and at least in the tail, the a sub n terms are bigger than this constant times b sub n. Well, multiplying by that constant is not going to impact the convergence or the divergence of b sub n. So now I've got the comparison going the right way, and I can conclude that the tail of the series with the a sub n terms, with the bigger terms, is going to be divergent and that means the entire series is divergent. So let's summarize what we just found. We said that if we have two series with positive terms, the limit of the ratio of the terms is a finite positive number C, then either both series are convergent or both series are divergent. So let's determine if the series uh, 
with terms 1 over radical n squared plus 1 is convergent or divergent. So normally we're not given the series that we need to compare against. Uh, but if we look at the uh, individual terms of the given series, you can get an idea of uh, what uh, series we should use for the comparison. So for example, in this case, when n is large, really n squared plus one is essentially the same as n squared, uh, which is of course one over radical n squared just gives me one over n. So that gives me a hint that I should probably compare against one over n. All this logic does is tell me what series to use for my additional work, my comparison. It makes no argument, mathematically sound argument that, oh, I can conclude right away without doing any more work that this series is divergent. I suspect it's divergent, but I'm going to have to use a test in order to determine whether it's convergent or divergent. And I'm going to use the limit comparison test because the terms of my series are directly smaller than the terms 1 over n. So I can't use the direct comparison test. But if I calculate the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio, and by the way, this limit comparison test doesn't require you to put your test series on top. You could put the test series on the bottom and the given series on top. It really doesn't matter. The conclusion is that as long as you have that limit equaling a finite number, um, then both series have the same behavior. They are either both convergent or both divergent. So when you're calculating the limit, you have a choice. Do whatever is most convenient or easiest for you to understand. In this case, I don't think there's any particular advantage of putting one particular uh, set of terms on the top and the other one on the bottom, because I mean, after simplifying this fraction, you just have the limit then as n goes to infinity of radical n squared plus 1 over n. Maybe this is a little bit easier to deal with. I can just write everything under the radical sign. And then under the radical sign, then I have 1 plus 1 over n squared. And the 1 over n squared will go to 0. So my limit value is 1. So that's good. Remember, my limit value has to be a finite positive number. And in this case, it's 1. So I can use the limit comparison test. And so since uh, the harmonic series is divergent and the limit of the ratio of the harmonic series in the given series uh, is a positive finite number, then by the limit comparison test, I can conclude that the given series is divergent as well. And again, you have to not only state the reason, but you have to show your work, which is going to validate your reason. Let's look at a different series. I have cosine squared of n over n squared plus 1. Now, cosine itself can be positive or negative, but since I'm squaring it here, all of my terms are going to be positive. And I know that cosine squared of n is less than or equal to 1. So cosine squared of n over n squared plus 1 will be less than 1 over n squared plus 1. And since n squared plus 1 is bigger than n squared, the reciprocal is smaller than 1 over n squared. So in this case, I can actually uh, use the direct comparison test. I don't need the limit comparison test. Uh, and because the series one over with 1 over n squared terms is convergent, 
we can just cite the p test for that and then we can use the direct comparison test or just the comparison test to state that the original series is convergent as well again it's not enough just to say convergent or divergent you have to show all of this type of work, make all of these statements, use your words, be verbose, use complete sentences. You're telling me a story. How do you know that this is convergent? Well, we know because of these inequalities holding true. We know that the series with the bigger term is convergent by the p-test. And now we're going to use the comparison test to conclude that the given series is also convergent. So here we have a, a series with n factorial over n to the power of n. And so sometimes dealing with these um, more exotic functions like the factorial function can give us trouble. Uh, we're going to get some more tests which are more appropriate with the factorial function. But here what we can do is always go back to looking at the sequence of uh, partial sums or looking at the values of the individual terms and see if we can use one of our comparison tests to determine if this series is convergent or divergent. And so this does require a little bit of trial and error. So one thing that I observed, it's also, this is a statement is, is also true. I can say, well, one is certainly equal to one over two to the power of zero. Two factorial over two squared is uh, less than, um, one over, well, that's equal to one half, which is one over two to the power of one. And three factorial over three to the power of three is less than one over two squared. So I'm beginning to see a pattern with the first few terms between the term and one over a power of two. I wanna see if this is gonna hold true in general. But certainly, uh, I'll start by just looking at the next couple of terms. Now, to make this argument work without actually just calculating the value, because if I can't find a mathematical reasoning for why this inequality holds true for every term, then it's really not formally correct. So, what do I have? I know that three factorial over three to the power of three is smaller than one over two squared. That was just a direct observation. Now, I'd like to make use of this fact to show that the next term would be smaller than one over two to the power of three. So I'm going to go from three factorial to four factorial from three to the power of three to four to the power of four. And I wanna show that's gonna be, that that term is smaller than one over two cubed. I'm trying to establish a pattern here. Well, that means I'm gonna to have to relate four to the power of four to three to the power of three. How can I do that? Well, Fortunately, I can see in this term that I really don't need four to the power of four because in the top and the bottom, the four, the initial four will divide to make one. So really I'll be left with, in this term, I should really think of it as being three factorial over four to the power of three. Well, to make sense of this, I'm going to make use of the binomial theorem. And not all of the binomial theorem, so we're not going to go through all of this. I only need to know what are the first two terms. If I have a binomial, a plus b, it's raised to the power of n. The first term is a to the power of n. 
The second term is n, so the uh, exponent on the binomial, times a times n to the, to, sorry, a to the power of n minus 1 times b, plus a bunch of other terms that are positive. So now I'm going to use this binomial theorem. Remember in this term, my fourth term of the series, the fours are going to divide out and I'll be left with three factorial over four cubed. Well, I'm gonna think of four cubed as being three plus one cubed. And why do I write it that way? Because I have a statement involving or an inequality involving three cubed. I'd like to leverage that information. So let's write out the binomial expansion of three plus one to the power of three. Now three is a small integer, so I really don't need to, to truncate this, uh, but it really all I'm interested in is the fact that this is going to equal three cubed plus three times three squared times one, uh, plus some more positive terms. So the whole binomial is greater than the sum of the first two terms. Well, after I multiply this out, really both of these are three cubed. It's this three cubed plus three cubed. So I have two times three cubed. Well, if I take the reciprocal then, that says that one over four cubed is less than one half times one over three cubed. And now I hope you get to see where I'm going, right? I'm going to leverage this inequality where three cubed is in the bottom to make a conclusion or new inequality about a fraction where I have four cubed in the bottom. Let's see how that works out. So our fourth term, four factorial over four to the power of four can really be written as three factorial over four to the power of three. So we said before, because the first four divides out. And what did I just say about one over four cubed? Well, if I think of four as being three plus one cubed, well, I know that one over three plus one cubed is less than one half times one over three cubed. So this has got to be less than one half times one over three cubed. And the three factorial stays in the numerator. Well, now I have three factorial over three cubed and I know the following inequality about three factorial over three cubed. I know that it is less than one over two squared. So I can replace the three factorial over three cubed with one over two squared. I multiply that times one half and I get one over two cubed. So my pattern is holding. That says that my fourth term, four factorial over four to the power of four is going to be less than one over two cubed. So I've got a pretty good pattern here for the first four terms. Let's solidify it with the fifth term. So five factorial over five to the power of five. I should be able to make the same argument. So let's use the binomial theorem. Again, I'm only interested in the first two terms here. Uh, the rest of the terms are positive. So if I throw them away, the result is that these two terms add up to something smaller than the entire power raised to the power of four. But I don't need to have you know, 
equality. I'm just looking for an inequality. So four, I'm sorry, five raised to the power of four uh, is larger than two times four raised to the power of four. So I'm going the right way because I have information about four factorial over four to the power of four. So one over five to the power of four, which is what I'll have in my fifth term, uh, is going to be less than one half times one over four to the power of four. So let's make our simplification. I can really write five factorial over five to the power of five as four factorial over five to the power of four. And I'll write five as four plus one. So I can use this inequality, right? One over four plus one to the power of four has got to be less than one half times one over four to the power of four. So I'm going to replace the one over four plus one to the power of four with half times one over four to the power of four. And again, the multiplier four factorial is still in the numerator. But now I can leverage the inequality that I just derived where four factorial over the four to the power of four is less than one over two cubed. So five factorial over five to the power of five is less than one half times one over two cubed or one over two to the power of four. So five factorial over five to the power of five is less than one over two to the power of four. And in fact, I can make this argument in general. Um, in that case, I would be using a process called proof by induction. We won't go through the formal statement of that, but suffice it to say that through formal mathematical arguments, we can conclude that n factorial over n to the power of n is smaller than one half raised to the power of n minus one. So now I've got a comparison, a comparison with, in fact, a convergent geometric series. And so by using the comparison test, I can conclude that the original series is convergent. And again, I had to show all of this work to be able to make this final conclusion. So I hope you found these videos useful and we will uh, continue with our tests. Uh, at the moment, we only have tests for convergence with series with positive terms. So we have the integral test, we have the comparison test, and we have the limit comparison test. Um, so um, we need to have some tests for terms where some of the terms are negative, and that'll be in our next video.